Hello there. Welcome to The Meaningful Stitch. This is episode six and I'm Amy Palco. I'm coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland. And this is my digital home from home. So a place where I get to share with you my knitting practice and my knitting projects. Today's podcast is going to be a little different than the ones before because I'm going to be announcing the winners of our giveaway, which I announced last time. And I'm also going to be answering the questions, well, some of the questions that uh, that you left for me in that last podcast. I got over 500 questions. <laughs> so if I answered them all, I would be here for a very long time and you'd get very bored of me, I'm sure. But I have managed to go through all of the questions. I've picked out a variety of different ones from a few different themes that kind of really presented in the in the questions and I'm going to go through those. So if you are new to this podcast, then please know this is not the normal way of how how I do my podcasts. So you might want to go back and watch one of the previous episodes for a taste of what you would more normally get. And next time in a couple of weeks when I record my next podcast, I'm going to be sharing all the knitting that I've been doing in the meantime. So I'll be catching you up on all of that. So that's still to come, still something to look forward to. But before then, I'm going to tackle these questions. <laughs> so before I do all of that, as always, I would draw a, an oracle card for us. And the deck that I've been using um, up till now has mostly been the Sacred Rebel or- Oracle deck. But this time I decided to use a different, a different oracle deck of mine, which is this one. It's the Fairies Oracle by Brian Froud. You might recognise the name. He did the Dark Crystal for one of for what well, he's done many things, but one of the things he did was the Dark Crystal. And I drew this card for us, which I think is a lovely one when we are going to be doing a question and answer session. So I drew Losguna. Look at her. Isn't she fabulous? Losguna is the Frog Queen. And when you draw her from the deck, she symbolises sunken treasure, discovery of self and adventure. The guidebook itself is very fun and it's uh, written in quite an irreverent style. So I just want to read you a little bit from that because I think it's very good fun. She says, have you ever noticed how people tend not to explore the territory they live in? how they only visit the special places there when they're trying to entertain someone from out of town. We do the same thing with so many aspects of our lives and then sometimes we grumble that life is dull. Life is always adventurous for adventurous people and boring for boring people. My grandmother told me this when I was nine and I expect she got it from Losguna. She also told me that if I didn't have anything interesting to do, I might as well clean up my room. (laughs) I took this lesson to heart and so can you. um, If life seems boring and you feel stuck in your puddle, either explore the parts of the puddle you haven't really seen before or jump out and do something new and interesting. I'm sure you, dear reader, are not a bored or boring person. Boring people don't read books like this. Or I would add, watch podcasts like this. (laughs) So it's a good fun card. I think it really invites in this place of inquiry and looking at our lives as special, which is something which I think is a really lovely message for every single one of us. And certainly a message that I'm taking to heart at the moment as I attempt to answer your questions, but also as I approach my birthday, which is tomorrow. So I'm really uh, leaning into this invitation to see our lives as special and It makes me think as well of that wonderful quote from the James Hillman book, The Soul Code, that we dull our lives by the way we conceive them. A good friend of mine, Kathleen, really loves that quote and has told me that several times. I think it's it's such a powerful and potent reminder um, that we are all invited to hold our lives as special. And so I want to say thank you before I I move on to all the questions and things um, for asking all those wonderful questions. Um, because they really do, they really did allow me to go back over and think about what my answers would be and to conceive of my life as special. And I would really invite all of you to do the same thing. Okay, so 
before we move on to the questions, <laughs> I just wanted to do the announcement for the giveaway. Uh, if you remember, I was giving away three sets of the Cocoon Tree bags. So these were project bags with matching Notions purses. And so I'm going to go through each of the prizes again and tell you who the winner is. I selected the winner at random from the, from the comments that had been left. And so the first one I want to share with you, so this is for the Mediterranean Sunrise bag with the matching Notions purse, which has got these beautiful little ducks on it. And this is a lovely, velvety bag with this beautiful woven silvery fabric at the bottom and there's the cocoon tree logo and of course it's got the the tassels on the zip and inside we have the matching the matching duck lining isn't it gorgeous so this very special prize package is going to baronessa so I will be getting in touch with all of these people through the comments that they left on the, the last podcast. And um, I would just invite you to get back in touch with me with your, with your details so that I can send these out. So this is Baronessa. Well done. <laughs> the second uh, prize that is going out is this Heathered Check bag. And again, it's the large project bag size and the matching the matching notions purse and again they've got this beautiful lining it's just so beautifully finished off and the tassel <laughs> and it's the matching lining inside isn't that just beautiful so this prize is going to look at my notes <laughs> Joan Summerside so Joan this is coming to you, my love. And like I said, I'm gonna get in touch with you uh, through the last comment, the comment where you asked your question and um, invite you to get in touch with me uh, so I can get that sent out to you. And the last, pro the last prize is this project bag, which is the medium size, so it's slightly smaller with its matching, its matching uh, Notions purse. Again, we've got this beautiful lining inside and this is teal floral and it's also got this beautiful woven fabric at the bottom as well and it's got its tassel and its handle and so this is going to go to Josie Dompierre so well done my love and um, like I said I'm going to get in touch with you and uh, congratulations congratulations to all the winners <laughs> and if you didn't win don't worry uh, there are bags still available on the cocoon trees from her cup from her current update on her Etsy shop and so you can go and check those out and uh, and maybe treat yourself um, as we move closer and closer to Christmas I think sometimes it's a good idea to treat ourselves before we get to the present buying <laughs> okay so next up I'm gonna start tackling these questions like I said there was a lot of questions and there was a lot of questions that fell into very particular themes. And so I've tried to put together those, th those questions and, um, and respond to them so that we can kind of move through them in a bit of an order, I suppose. <laughs> but there is a lot. So I'm hoping that um, this is not going to be terribly long and boring for you and that, uh, that you're going to enjoy it and get something out of it too. And I hope that we get to know each other a bit better because that's really the whole point of this. So, the first questions are all about the podcast. <laughs> so, Hakmar Ann asked, how did you come up with the name of your podcast, The Meaningful Stitch? Uh, I think naming products, offerings, podcasts, books, whatever, <laughs> classes, um, is actually one of the hardest things to do. And we can get really hung up on it. So, for me, I sat and, I, and knitted, of course, and really try to think about what was the message that I wanted to convey with this podcast? What did I want people to know about their knitting and their making? What did I want them to know about my knitting and my making? <laughs> and I think one of the most important things was that every stitch holds meaning. 
that uh, this practice that we are all engaged in here is it, it holds importance and it holds significance that is even greater than the final product that the very practice and progress and process of our knitting is uh, valuable and valued and I really wanted to reflect that. I wanted us to be able to dive a little bit deeper uh, uh, below the surface of patterns and yarns and into what these uh, projects actually mean for us and what is the message that, that we're trying to communicate with these, with these uh, projects and with these knitting practices. So that was really why I started to circle this concept of the meaningful stitch. And I'm really happy with it. I'm, I'm really pleased with it. I feel it does, it ticks all the boxes for me. <laughs> so if you are struggling to name something and you're getting caught up with that, perhaps think about what is the experience that you want people to receive from what, you're, what it is that you're offering. Uh, whether that's a new business or whether that's a book or what is the, what's the nub of the message that you are trying to communicate with what it is that you're creating because I feel like the Meaningful Stitch does that for me here. Carol Weymouth asks, have you, have you got any public speaking experience? And if so, does that make podcasting on YouTube more comfortable? Well, I do have some public speaking experience because I was a university teacher for a number of years. And so I would teach small groups, but I would also teach uh, large in large lecture theatres and that was a <laughs> that was a scary and and uh, exhilarating experience sometimes I did much prefer doing the small group teaching I would really like to create an, an intimate atmosphere and really curate the experience of of that group and uh, and that teaching experience so so yes, I do have some public speaking experience and, al and also um, when I was doing uh, research into literature, I would go to international conferences and I would present academic papers at those as well. So that would be to, to audiences of my peers. And so, so yes, I do have some experience of it. Does it make it easier? Um, I suppose, uh, I don't really know because I don't know what, what the opposite would be. I've not, not podcasted before I had it, so. <laughs> um, but I suppose it might do. Uh, it does make you more aware of, of how you communicate and how you want to connect, what you want to deliver through your, through your messaging, what tone you want to take and how you want to invite your audience into this into this experience that we're co-creating together. So I think it does make you think a lot more about those kinds of, of things so that it perhaps becomes easier to create that in a, in a digital format. But like I said, I've, I've not had the opposite experience, so I don't really know if it makes it easier or not. <laughs> Spirit Bridger asks, was it scary when you first got started podcasting? It is scary because it's a scary thing to put ourselves out into the world. You know, we are, we're, we're taught, we have this part of our, our lizard brain which really asks us to stay still, stay quiet, st you know, don't make, a, don't make a scene, don't draw attention to yourself. Um, and so we really have to battle that part of ourselves to be able to show up and more fully shine. And yet we're so beautifully rewarded when we do, or certainly that's my experience. So yes, it is, uh, it is an unnerving thing to put oneself out there into the world and yet absolutely worth it. So, <laughs> Okay, moving on from the podcast questions, we're going to start the family questions. There was quite a lot of questions about my family. So the first question is from Mike and Emma Wilson and she asks, I would like to ask for you to tell us more about your parents and how they ended up in France. Well, I know that my mum and dad watch, so hi mum and dad, <laughs> in France. <laughs> so we used to go to France on our summer holidays as a large family group, so with grandparents and aunties and uncles. And it was always a lot of fun. We would um, get some self-catering 
accommodation close to a beach. Uh, we'd visit creperies, we'd see the fireworks on Bastille Day. It was always very magical. And my parents always really loved France. And so when my dad retired, gosh, it must be about six years ago now, they decided that that was where they wanted to live. Now that, that dad wasn't tied to the, to the hospital where he was working, uh, they had the opportunity to go to wherever they wanted. And so they decided that they wanted to move to France and they found a beautiful part of France to live in, which has strong Scottish connections through the, through the whiskey making process and the cognac making process. <laughs> and, um, and they live in a, in a lovely property surrounded by vineyards and they both speak fluent French and uh, and they're very happy there so which is a lovely thing so they live over there and we live over here and we go and try and visit each other uh, a few times throughout the year which is nice because we get to spend these long periods of time together uh, unlike when they lived over here we would go and visit and we might, would maybe go for dinner or pop round for coffee and spend a couple of hours with each other but now when we see one another we get to spend say two three weeks together and that's very different that, that kind of quality of time you get to spend with with your loved ones in that way so that's that's very lovely and of course with technology too as we get to we get to catch up and spend time with each other through through FaceTime uh, for which I'm, I'm very grateful to So, that's how they ended up in France. <laughs> Sally Journey asks, how are, you, how are you finding ways to keep close to the people around you during this COVID time? Going into this winter, I'm wondering how to keep connected with that layer of people outside of my pod. It's very difficult. I think COVID has really created situations where we are becoming increasingly isolated um, from one another. And that's a very painful thing, actually. So it really requires us, I think, to, to reach out and connect in a variety of different ways. I think, as I was saying, technology is certainly one of those ways. I find that we have family WhatsApp groups that, uh, that are absolutely vital for us. So we can connect with other, other members of the family that live in different parts of the country that we would normally be seeing on a more regular basis, but currently are not seeing very much of each other right now. Um, as we are coming into winter and we are facing more restrictions and more lockdown conditions, I decided that it would be a lovely thing to create a film club with some of my family. And so I've started the process of, of doing that so that we can have some things to share together. So I think film clubs, book clubs, having things that we can enjoy together apart or apart together <laughs> uh, so that we can have conversations about it and it gives us new material to bring into our conversations, which I think when we're not going out and not very much seems to be happening, we can kind of run out of uh, run out of material, but I think when we are watching movies together or we're reading books together, we're experiencing art together, that really gives us the opportunity to bring that into into our our conversations. The other thing, and this is something that that my mum and dad, mum and I have done last year, and we're doing it again this year, is we've created advent calendars for each other using our yarn stashes and buying some yarn in as well. And so we're wrapped, we've wrapped up all the individual balls or skeins of yarn and sent them over to each other um, so that we have something new to open, a small gift uh, for each day leading up to Advent. So I think that's a lovely way to, to communicate and connect with one another in a more sort of tangible way. Also, I would use the example of the birds of a feather shawl that my mum and I knitted uh, two versions of using the same yarn. So there was that, that point of connection too, that we were creating something that was distinct and individual to each of us, but were, was absolutely knitted um, in tandem. And so we, we have these, these items, these shawls, these soul skins almost that we get to, that, that share an affinity with one another. And so I think that has really helped us to, to strengthen our, our loving connection there too. 
And I would also say that, you know, I'm continually reading and sharing articles with, with people that I love. I, I'm always interested in continuing to reach out and make those, make those positive points of connection and receiving those positive points of connection. Things that make us laugh. I've got, uh, I've got a group a message thread that I have with my children when we're always sending each other memes and funny videos and things, finding things that, that you know, speak to family in jokes. And I think that's, uh, I think bringing humour into is also a, a really important, important part of, of staying connected. Okay. I find that your family name is Hungarian. Do you agree? And if yes, can you tell us more about it? Asked Sofia Barta. Yes, my second name is Hungarian, Amy Palko. Palko is a Hungarian name. And that is because my husband is Hungarian. <laughs> so we got married, it will be 23 years this Sunday. It's our 23rd anniversary, the day after my birthday. And um, yes, so he and his family emigrated out to Australia when he was two years old. And then he left Australia, I think when he was 28 years old. And I met him the following year. Uh, so, so yes, and he is, we got married fairly quickly and uh, we've been, we've lived in, the, in Scotland ever since. So, uh, so yes, uh, my second name is Hungarian. I don't speak very much Hungarian. My daughter speaks some Hungarian and my husband is fluent Hungarian. Uh, so Hungarian culture and traditions um, and language are still very much a part of our of our household. Um, but it is an exceptionally difficult language to learn. <laughs> I learned um, some Latin languages, I suppose, when I was when I was a teenager. So Spanish and Italian and French, but uh, Hungarian is a very differently constructed language, and so one that doesn't necessarily come easy. I can understand a lot more of it than I can speak, let's put it that way. <laughs> so, what is the best lesson or advice that you got from your mum? This is from Ina Jelicic. Well, gosh, lots of things. One of the things that makes me think of is, <laughs> one of the things my mum tells me is, what's for me won't go past me, which I think is a very Scottish saying. But basically, it means that, uh, you know, there's no point in getting stressed and upset about something because if it's meant to happen, it will me it'll be meant to happen. So we can, we can stop worrying, we can stop being anxious about it because it's, it's already in a process of unfolding. And if it's meant to be, then it will be. So that's, cer that's certainly one of the pieces of advice. But I would say, actually, perhaps an even more important one would be about creative bravery. I think my mum is a very brave and courageous woman and pursues her creativity and her self-expression from that place. And so that has led her all over the world, um, chasing down teachers and uh, classes and new modalities. She is an exceptional artist. She makes beautiful artist books and most recently she has just tackled the most amazing knit it is a jumper from one of the old rowan magazines and it is the most phenomenal piece of intarsia you have ever seen in your life and so she uh, she very bravely tackled that and has been working on that for the last five weeks and has just recently completed so seeing the way that she approaches her knitting, her artistic practice, and her love of um, self-expression and mastering new skills, and I think that's been a that's been a lovely thing to to witness and and to learn from. Do any of your kids knit amethyst nineteen? Yes, my daughter knits. <laughs> my daughter is a continental style knitter, although she didn't used to be. She was a an English style knitter like myself, but Aurora is uh, left handed, and so knitting with holding her yarn in her right hand was really very problematic for her. 
and was so she was quite slow and laborious with with her knitting uh, but now that she knits continental with the yarn held in her left hand she's sped up significantly <laughs> and in fact she's just finished off a beautiful pair of fingerless uh, gloves so with the little little fingers in some gorgeous yarn which i think is an iron weight from old maiden aunt that she picked up at edinburgh yarn festival a couple of years ago and i would say too that that going to edinburgh yarn festival with my daughter and with my mum has been a really lovely thing the last few years and obviously it didn't run this year and it doesn't look like it's going to run next year so I am hoping that it's going to going to return so that so that um I can return to going to that with my with my daughter and my mum. But my boys don't knit. I can't really imagine them them picking up a ball of yarn and knitting. Uh, Jessica Ray asks, I'd like to know what's your advice for raising teenage boys? Don't make them knit. <laughs> no, I would say the most important thing in raising teenage boys is to keep the channels of communication open and to remain as non-judgmental as possible, which is sometimes an impossible task. <laughs> and you really want to reach in and, and say, I told you so, or to direct them along a particular path. Uh, but you have to do it, I think, with quite a light touch. And to eat dinner together. I think eating dinner, eating meals together is important. I think creating family experiences and creating the invitations to join you in those experiences are important. Creating memories together. And a lot of that kind of work, I suppose, is done earlier on in, in their childhood, but it's something that continues. I think that teenage boys are, are lo I love teenagers. Um, I think they have wonderful ways of looking at the world. I think they have so much to teach us. I think if we really respect that and we honour that rather than undermining it and thinking that we know better all the time, uh, breeds uh, a respectful relationship between between you um, and it can also be incredibly challenging and incredibly difficult um, I think some of the most challenging moments I would say that as a, as a parent that I've experienced would be those times when the your kids are out at night time and you have to go to bed and then you're lying in bed waiting for them to come home and you're wondering if they're okay and uh, all of that, I find that very, I have found that very stressful, but um, trusting in their resilience and it, that it's something that you have invested in and and also knowing that they will make mistakes, but if they're, they are resilient enough and that, that you'll be there to, to help pick up the pieces as and when you're required to. And yeah, it's raising teenagers is not easy, boys or girls. <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, keeping the channels of communication open is the best piece of advice that I could possibly give you. How many generations of knitters are in your family? From Diane Giannini. We have no idea. <laughs> so I know that, uh, well obviously I know that my grandparents knit, my grandma knits, my gran on my other side has also also knits too. Um, has knitted too. I wouldn't say she's as enthusiastic a knitter as my grandma on my other side has been, but I certainly know that she has knitted in the past and has enjoyed it. Um, beyond that, uh, well, I know that going down the line of my gran, she is from, her father is from Orkney and she has inherited a spinning wheel. So I'm assuming that there were was spinning as in those gener in that generational line, and so that probably meant there was knitters too. Um, on the other side of the family, with my grandma and my granddad, who are from Fife, we have a wonderful photograph actually of my great granddad who died, I think, when I was about 15, 16. So his father was a wonderful fair isle knitter, and he would do the knitting, and his wife, my great great grandma, would do the seaming, she would sew it all up for him. <laughs> so this photograph that we have is of my great granddad wearing a fair isle vest that his father had knitted for him. And he, my, my great great grandfather that did the knitting, was actually a miner. 
um, who had lost a finger. So you can only imagine that's not doesn't make for terribly easy easy knitting, but he did absolutely beautiful work. So beyond that, I mean, I would imagine somebody must have taught him. And <laughs> so yes, we don't really know how many generations of of knitters there are, but what I do know is it goes back as far as we can remember, and it's being passed down through the through the next generation. So the younger the younger generations are learning also. So it's going in both directions, which is a lovely, a lovely thing. And I think it uh, really speaks to the health of the practice and uh, the, the value that it really brings us. One last family question. Do you have any pets? And if so, what are their names? Jackie Rock. I do not have any pets. I don't have it. I've, I have never owned a cat. I've never owned a dog. I have occasionally owned fish. <laughs> but uh, our last fish was called Gil and with his trusty sidekick Finn <laughs> but that was a while ago now and, and so we don't have any we don't have any pets at all we generally for the last 10 years have lived in rented accommodation and that tends to make having pets quite difficult and so so yeah I'm afraid we don't have any pets <laughs> okay on to food I had quite a few food questions, so I've, I've chosen two. Uh, the first is, do you have a recommendation when it comes to a recipe? Well, I have a recommendation when it comes to a recipe book, which is this one. This is the Moosewood Cookery Book by Molly Katzen. It's a vegetarian cookbook. We are not vegetarian in this household, um, but uh, we do enjoy um, vegetarian cooking. And this is a book that my mum used to cook meals for us from when we were little. So a lot of the flavours and some of the special recipes in this book really remind me of my, of my childhood and give me that taste of home, so to speak. So some of my favourites in this book is the Arabian squash casserole, which is delicious and I love some of their soup recipes as well. They have a beautiful cauliflower cheese soup. They have one of the best um, recipes for tomato sauce that I've ever found. It's got a really lovely recipe for tabbouleh and some great pie recipes too. So there's an apple and custard pie and a pumpkin pie that just absolutely yeah, have the flavours of home for me. So the Moosewood Cookery Book would be my, would be my go-to <laughs> for a, a recipe uh, to recommend to you. And Sharon W asks, my question is, what is your favourite go-to comfort food for a Scottish winter day? Well, Scottish people love their soup, so it would have to be a lentil soup, I think. My brother makes a particularly good lentil soup, so... So I, that's what I would choose, my brother's lentil soup. We do have lots of uh, like new companies springing up that are offering new varieties of soup, new flavours of soup uh, that really draw on more um, world cuisine, I suppose. But, uh, but I do love the, the very traditional soups like uh, leek and potato or scotch broth. My granddad makes a wonderful scotch broth. So, so yes, I can wax lyrical about soup for a while, but <laughs> not quite as long as my friend Jen can, though, because she loves, she loves a good soup, don't you, love? <laughs> the next questions are all about the goddesses. So I had mentioned in my first podcast that I am a goddess guide, and that's, what, that's how I make my living. <laughs> that's, that's, what my, that's what my business is, is offering goddess guidance. So I had quite a lot of questions about this. Uh, understandably so. Some a lot of people ask it, saying things like they they'd never heard of a goddess guide and you know what was it and how did I become one and the the honest truth is is that the the reason why you haven't heard of a goddess guide is because I made the word up. <laughs> I made the term. So I decided uh, what would be the best way to describe what I do. Uh, what would be my job title if I could give myself one and that's the job title I gave myself. So if you've not heard of a goddess guide before, that's probably why. <laughs> but it does very accurately describe what it is that I do. So and I'll and I'll go on to that in a bit. So the first question that I have is 
Could you please share more about how you've transitioned from university work to what you offer your clients now? So, uh, throughout my 20s, I really focused in on my academic work. So I did my undergraduate and my master's and my PhD all at Stirling University, focusing in on English literature and on story, because I love story. And so I'm really very well trained in spotting patterns and uh, creating new frameworks for seeing. I've done a lot of teaching. I've taught, I've taught hundreds of students uh, from first year through to master's students, uh, looking at uh, narrative and characterization. And so all of that was, was kind of what, what my, my background is really. And from there, when I finished up doing my PhD, or just as I was coming towards the end of it, I went to the, the business advice people at the university that, that I went to and asked them, you know, I have all of these skills, uh, what, what kind of business do you think I could create? And uh, they were not terribly helpful, I have to say, <laughs> and told me that they could give me an office and a phone. So not really knowing what I would do with an office or a phone at that point, I decided not to take them up on it. <laughs> <laughs> but it really um it really got me thinking about well what what is it that I can provide what what kind of support can I give and I think the best kind of support we can give is was one that's authentically grounded in what has worked for us and so for me that's absolutely been my my goddess path my goddess guidance explorations and the way in which they've supported me to more fully show up and engage with my life so, Kelly Keep says, I would be interested to know what it means to be a goddess guide. Could you tell us something about this work that you do? So, I think that, well, to begin with, there are so many goddesses. There are so many stories, so many wonderful myths. And a myth is basically a way of describing something, a way of, of understanding something, which is inherently, you know, difficult to understand otherwise. And it speaks to us about human behaviour, about why we do the things that we do. So in order to understand our own behavioural patternings better, one of the things we can do is we can look at myth and we can look at these particular archetypes, these particular characters, uh, these gods and goddesses from these stories and see how they play out. And then looking at their uh, stories as metaphors for particular parts and pieces of our own psyche, our own self. So in that way, these archetypes really allow us to create mirrors to, to reflect ourselves back to ourselves. So we can enter into greater seeing, greater awareness, greater consciousness about who we are. And I think what that does is that it deepens our sense of self-acceptance. I mean, it's very difficult to accept parts of ourselves when we can't even see them. <laughs> So by shining a light on these different facets of self, we get to move into deeper, um, a deeper place of self-acceptance. And then from that place, we get to move out into the world offering, um, offering greater empathy and compassion to all. And I would say that's the macro of, of what it is that I want to achieve with my business. In a more granular sense, <laughs> I have a number of offerings and products uh, that I that I do throughout the year, and they basically range from annual readings. So I do the My Word Goddess readings, which launch uh, at the end of this month, and they run for two months. So if you want to know who your goddess of the year is going to be, I have a PDF creation um, that that will that will connect you up to a goddess that you can explore and um, through a variety of different creative practices. So that's a lot of fun. I do monthly readings as well, so people can apply for people can sign up for a subscription, so they receive a monthly reading. I do one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, through Zoom, so I meet up with clients and we speak about the material of their lives and what's showing up for them and who the goddess for their for them for that month is and how that goddess can provide some. A deeper understanding and clearer seeing for them and and the material that they're that they're working through 
I draw upon tarot cards and oracle cards in these sessions and we also look at astrological charts as well because I've been studying those for but the last, gosh, coming up for nine years of, of astrological study. So looking at goddess asteroids in particular and where they, they're positioned in charts. So I do that too. I have offered in the past business circles and creativity circles. I've offered particular or Facebook groups that allow us to uh, look at particular goddesses together and I have offered uh, selfie workshops before so looking through the medium of self-portraiture as a way of reflecting back different aspects of the goddess as it's reflected in, in us um, as we as we express her so there, there's a variety of different offerings that, that, I, that I give as ways of connecting in or offering points of connection to the goddess in general so so yeah, that's a little bit of, of what I do. It's good fun. <laughs> Lady Dreamwalker asks, could you share a particular goddess archetype you work most closely with yourself and have you found that it, she has changed over time? One of the goddesses that I work most closely with is a Greek goddess called Hestia or Vesta to the to the Romans. She is the goddess of the inner hearth. She is the goddess of home, of promises and of practice. So I think of her as a goddess of the inward turning spiral. So when I'm feeling very scattered and very um, overextended, she's the goddess that helps me pull my energy back so that I can tend to my inner flame, which I know is something that we've discussed here before a few episodes back. So what is this inner hearth? What is this vital spark? What is it that I can do to take best care of that? Uh, Hestia is really the goddess that I lean into that offers me some deeper understandings of how to do that. Uh, she's an incredibly important goddess to me. She's one of the very first goddesses that I connected to through uh, a visualization that I created for myself. And uh, I've always found her a very, um, a very, strong sense of support and peace and ease. So whenever I'm feeling at um, out of ease with myself, she's the one that calls me back in to listen to my own inner voice, my own inner guidance, and really come back to a, to a place of center. So I would say that's, that's one particular goddess that I connect very deeply to and continues to be a very strong source of support because, you know, what times well, look at the times that we're currently living through, you know, both politically and with the public health crisis and economic crises. So all these crises are, are moving through the, the social atmosphere. And when all of that is occurring, then I think it really does help us to, to really connect in with ourselves, find our point, find our centre point, find that place to come back to. And, uh, and Vesta Hestia really helps me to do that. I also feel as though she's very present in my in my craft and in my practice. So for me, a practice is any action that is repeated with intent. So absolutely, my knitting fits into this, and I think of Hestia as a as a goddess that helps that guides us towards a meditation of hands and of body. So about trying to get us out back out of our head trying to disinvest from those um, fant negative fantasies, um, anxieties, fears and worries, come back into the body and move through this meditation of hands. And, and for me, knitting is really a meditation of hands. So again, that's, that's another way in which I really connect still to, to Hestia. What advice would you give a woman in her 30s growing into her 40s regarding body and soul? Is there something I should consider? Well, if you haven't read it already, I would say <laughs> read my favourite book. <laughs> so, Women Who Run With The Wolves is written by Clarissa Pinkola Estes. And you may have heard of it before because it is, it's an older book now. I think it came out in the 1970s or 1980s. Um, let me see. Oh, no, 1992. There you go. It's not as old as I thought, but 1992. 
Uh, it is a wonderful collection of stories and analyses, and it's looking at the very particular archetype of the wild woman. And so it looks at some goddess narratives, but mostly is looking at archetypes from fairy and folktale. And so it's got some retellings of that, and then some deeper explorations of the archetype of the wild woman and how she and how she shows up in all of her various guises and how we can track her both in the stories that are important to us but also in our own lives and in our feelings and in our desires and so i would say that if you haven't read this book yet and you're entering into your 40s i would absolutely get yourself a copy now it apologies because I can, <laughs> can can you tell it's my favorite book <laughs> It's falling apart. Oh dear. Um, I would say that it is a thick book and it's a dense book. It's uh, a lot of people hear about this book and buy it and then they start reading it and they don't get very far with it. And so my recommendation would be to look at the contents page, pages here and read the titles, read the stories and go for the chapter that most calls to you. Rather than reading it in chronological order or sequential order, choose your own sequence with it. Go to the chapter that you think intuitively is going to meet you in this particular moment with whatever it is that you're struggling with and, um, and read it that way. And then once you've read that chapter, digested it, explored it, walked with it, knitted with it, had conversations about it, um, have a look, go back again to the to the chapter, the contents page and choose your next chapter. So I think for me, the best way to approach this book, and it's something that I've guided a lot of other women through, is um, to do a choose your own adventure style um, of approach to this, to this particular text. And that might help you to guide your own red thread through the, through the chapters and the stories. But yes, I would say men and women in their 30s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. And in fact, I gave it to my daughter for her 16th birthday um, because I think it's an incredibly important text and that we should all have our, have our very <laughs> battered copies of it for, because it's been so well read. So that would be my advice. <laughs> uh, my question is, this is from Suzanne Walker. Given your work with goddess archetypes, have you any thoughts about whether there is a more feminine version or interpretation of the classic hero's journey structure used in storytelling? So if you're not familiar with the hero's journey, it's very much about um, there being a crisis within the household of some sort. And so the need to leave home, go on your quest, go on your adventure, meet your challenges, overcome your obstacles, uh, receive the gifts or the the bounty from from your quest and then return home and so that's the hero's journey it's about moving outside into the external and then coming back and, and reconnecting and um, integrating that that outward journey with the inner I would say the heroine's journey is actually a, a narrative of descent I think we are asked to come right back into what is present for us and to go on a, an experience that way rather than moving out the the call is to move in and then having integrated what we discover within about giving that some form of outer expression and I think the hero's journey and the heroine's journey are both important to all men and women you know and I think um, the the topic of gender is a, is a very problematic one and so I, I would really like to move beyond uh, talking about women's journeys and men's journeys and whether it's a good book for a man or for a woman. I think these are these are journeys, these, these like the goddess archetypes, um, are available to us all. You know, this is all part, this is all our inheritance, this is all material that and um, medicine that is available to all of us. So so that the heroine's journey is just as, as available to men as the hero's journey is available to, to women and, and to everybody. So, uh, so yes, that, that, would be, that would be my thoughts around that. So there are some really interesting goddess narratives uh, that very explicitly explore the heroine's journey of descent, 
So you might want to look at the narrative of Inanna and her descent to visit her sister Erishkigel in the underworld. Uh, you might want to explore Persephone, which might be a slightly more familiar goddess to you from the ancient Greek, when she uh, is abducted into the underworld uh, and becomes ultimately becomes the queen of the underworld. And the other narrative from the ancient Greeks is the narrative of Psyche, who has to move through a number of tasks to be reunited with her love, Eros. But also in the fourth task also includes an underworld visit and so also speaks to a narrative of descent. So, so yeah, some things to explore. And the last one is from Nadine Touze, and she asks, what is the connection between goddesses and knitting? So I suppose I kind of already answered that one with connection to, to Vesta and, and Hestia, this meditation of hands. But, you know, I also connect it to um, a goddess like Ariadne, you know, Ariadne in the labyrinth. She's the one that provided the red thread to Perseus so that he could find his way into the heart of the labyrinth and find the Minotaur and then find his way back home again. So I think of her as the goddess of the red thread and I think of the, the thread, the, the yarn that I'm working with as very much the, the stuff of my own life, you know, and I, and I get to make whatever I want from it. I get to frog it, <laughs> I get to re-knit it, I get to, to you know, weave in new colours, I get to learn new skills, I get to explore new patterns, new textures, new fibres. Uh, and through all of that, I'm really exploring my, my self-expression, I'm exploring my heritage, I'm exploring what my own personal legacy is. And all of that, I think, is this red thread that weaves through the labyrinthine passages of my own, of my own personal existence, of my day-to-day -day life as it's lived in this moment, but also, you know, this, this life that I'm curating and creating as, um, as the years go by. And which, you know, ultimately, and, you know, I think of my, of these beautiful shawls that I've been creating or these beautiful garments, um, and they will outlive me for a time. And I think, you know, having that, um, that tangible expression of me in this particular ex moment, this particular existence, this particular lifetime is that, that red thread that moves from, from my generations before me, from my existence right now, and then forward and into the future. So also makes me think of the the mori which is the three fates you know the from again from the from the greeks so we have the the goddesses that that spin and measure and cut the threads of life you know and i think of them quite often when i'm when i'm engaging in an, in an artistic project and in, in um, particularly with my with my knitting practice and my craft so there are lots of there are lots of goddesses there's also arachne who is the goddess, that, but she's the one that was turned into a spider by Athena <laughs> um, for, for daring to challenge Athena to a, to a tapestry making uh, contest. Athena is actually our goddess of crafts. And so she's the one that helps us to perceive of what the finished object is going to be before we've even cast on our first stitch. She helps us to, to plan out our, our, in, our stages, our sections, our the bigger picture is already imagined before we actually start to, to tackle it. And she's also the one that helps us to uh, use the, the tools and the problem solving at our disposal when we, when we come across challenges so that we can really bring our project home. So there are lots of goddesses that I think, well, I think the goddesses provide frameworks for seeing any aspect of our life. So if we want to use these archetypes to see our craft, to see our knitting, they absolutely offer us insight into that. If we want to look at them to offer us insight into the way we parent, into the way that we make art, into the way that we relate with our partners, into the way that we show up for our communities, you know, whatever, whatever it is, I think the goddesses provide mirrors. They provide these perspectives, these frameworks for seeing that help us to understand ourselves, our motivations and our conditionings better. And ultimately, hopefully, help us to align more fully with our desires and our values so that we can continue showing up in integrity 
and with great love and, and empathy and kindness for ourselves and for others. Okay, so moving on from the goddesses. Hair. I cannot tell you how many questions I got about my hair. <laughs> I'm afraid you're going to be terribly disappointed with my answers. <laughs> so I chose one of the questions. This is by Crystal de Groot Hep. And she says, uh, I'm in awe of your beautiful hair colour. <laughs> I'm wondering if that is natural and if it's your natural silver grey. I'd love to know what, co what colour your hair was before it went that colour. And I'd love to see a picture of you from years past if you're inclined to share. Now, I'm going to pop some photographs onto my Instagram so you can see the colours of my hair before it went this colour. Because this is my natural colour. Um, I don't I don't dye it at all. Uh, this is the colour that it has gone. <laughs> I started going grey from a very early age, in my early 20s. In fact, I probably had a few grey hairs when I was a teenager. But really, I would say it was when I was about 22, 23 that I formed very strong streaks of, of silver through my through my hair. And then by the time I was 30, I'd pretty much gone completely this kind of colour. Although I would say over the last 10 years, it's much, it's much lighter. So it's continuing to, it's continuing to, to go its way and, and to change. I, I don't do anything really to my hair to, <laughs> to, um, to look after it particularly well. I, I suppose I, I described, I was laughing with my mum yesterday, I said, I would really describe my um, my hair care routine as one of <laughs> as one of neglect to a certain extent. I I wash it every couple of days with a normal with just an ordinary shampoo and conditioner that you know just a commercial one. I tend to use um, intensive hair masks as conditioner because grey hair um, or hair that is that is changed mature hair tends to be a little bit coarser and drier. So you might need to have a bit more extra moisture in your in your conditioner. So I tend to use like intensive masks as regular conditioner. Um, I don't dry my hair so it doesn't get any heat on it. I let it dry by itself and I don't use any products in it. So there you go. That was a that was a short answer. <laughs> but my hair color before was actually uh, well, when I was when I was a little girl, it was a very strong shade of kind of a, a red gold, I suppose. And then as I got older, my hair darkened. And so it was a, it was a kind of a rich auburn shade. And then obviously that, that lightened up significantly through my twenties and thirties until I am the age that I am now. <laughs> okay. So next questions is about colors, not about the color of my hair, but about the colour of my yarns and my and my art. So Michelle Legg asks, do you have an art background that gives you the skills to be so creative with colour? And the answer to that is no, I don't. I don't have an art background. Um, I suppose I have a hum arts and humanities background because my, um, my academic background is in literature, but not in the visual arts. Uh, so, and I just wanted to kind of underscore that because I don't think you need a formal academic training or uh, or professional experience of colour to be able to be playful with it and to enjoy it. I, I think that's available to all of us. And Vera Paleman asked, where do you get your inspiration for creating such beautiful colour combination? I would say that I have, I move through real love affairs with colours. <laughs> And that will vary depending on the season. So for example, in the summertime, I love a really hot pink coral paired with like an army green or a, or a spicy mustard. I love those shades together and um, paired up with some like dark wood uh, jewelry and some tan leather accessories. I'm, I'm so there for that. I love that. In the winter time, I love moving back into these beautiful kind of burgundy shades and rich golds and uh, cinnamons and all of those kind of, and rust, all of those lovely, lovely rich shades. I love a hot red as well, like a really beautiful scarlet. I love black as well. I love, love to wear black. 
I think it's very dramatic. Um, I, I don't think there is any colours that I don't really like. I would say I, I don't tend to wear cool colours. I tend to wear hot or warm colours. Uh, that's just because of my own colouring and what suits me. So I don't wear uh, white because when I do, I look like death warmed up. <laughs> I can wear like off-white, I can wear ivory, but I don't tend to. That's that's maybe one colour that I, that I really don't move towards or not really a colour, but um, but yes, I don't I don't tend to, to go towards the more uh, light or cool shades. Uh, I tend to try and keep a, a warm a warm palette. And as for inspiration, I'm always looking for inspiration. I love Instagram. I love looking to see what colours people are putting together. I love when I'm out and about looking at um, unexpected colour pairings. Quite often when you see like groups of people walking down the street and they're all wearing different colours, so they've not necessarily put the colours together, but you get to see like what do these shades look like together. Uh, I love looking at artwork and looking at the, the colours that people have paired in their, in their art. And, and what else? I think colour is there to be played with. You know, I, I don't think it's something to feel um, nervous about or afraid of or shy of. I, I think it's something to be explored. It's something to be enjoyed. And so I think you just, just allow yourself to be pulled to cut towards the colours that you love most and that make your heart happy. Because how could that be, how could that be a wrong colour combination? <laughs> oh, one last idea is I love uh, looking at, I mean, we have so many incredibly creative makers in our community. Like, uh, and one of those kinds of makers is uh, yarn dyers. And yarn dyers have such an amazing eye for colour and they put together these beautiful tonal palettes or they create beautiful variegated yarns with, with speckles. Now one of the things I like to do is look at those variegated yarns and see what kinds of colours are they putting together and then maybe separating some of them out into more solid tonals and then exploring that within one particular one particular pattern, one particular design, one particular shawl. So um, so yes, that's certainly another another sort of place to, to look for inspiration. But really, you know, in this in this community we are so incredibly blessed because we're surrounded by gorgeous colour inspiration. So so you'll you'll see it everywhere. When you develop the eye for it, when you're looking out for it, you see it everywhere. You can't not see it. Okay, so not surprisingly, I got a lot of knitting questions. So I'm going to go through them and see how many I'm going to get through. Gosh, I've still got so many questions here. I'm not sure I'm going to get through all of these at all. <laughs> so anyway, maybe some shorter answers to this, uh, to the knitting questions. Oh, probably not starting with this one, no. My question is, what is your knitting journey? <laughs> Who taught you to knit and how old were you? Have you knit ever since or have you had periods in your life when you didn't knit? So my grandma taught me how to knit. I remember learning how to do finger knitting, you know, where you, you create your slip stitch and then you put your fingers through and you catch the yarn and you pull it through to create the next and then the next, like the little bird that goes through and picks out the worm through the hole and then pulls it up. So I remember doing that lots and lots um, as a little girl. And also uh, we would do the, you know, my grandma would give us a, an old spool that had four nails um, knocked into it. And we would, we would create um, these kind of long tubes of knitted, knitted fabric by, um, by, with a crochet hook and taking the yarn over the top of each one of the nails and moving, wrapping the yarn round and, creating our stitches that way so they would come out the bottom of the of the spool and then we would you know wind them all together and sew them to make like coasters or placemats or that kind of thing. I cannot remember the first sort of properly knitted thing that I ever that I ever made. I do remember learning it's doing knitting at school but I do know that I already knew how to knit when I was at school so this is probably when I was about seven years old. So it was really the first time I did colour work. 
um, and it was just very simple and we were making uh, these holders for our recorded uh, for our recorders <laughs> I wasn't very good at playing the recorder but I was quite good at making the case for the recorder <laughs> and mine was in kind of a mustard a gold shade and a maroon like a burgundy and the color work that we did was we knitted a bit in burgundy and then we would do like two in burgundy and two in mustard two in burgundy and two in mustard and then repeat it for another row and then just move into the mustard so we had like this kind of crossover check um that would that would help you transition from one shade to the other so i remember doing that um and then I, I probably didn't knit terribly much as a, as, I don't remember knitting as a teenager much at all um, until I got to about the age of 18, 19, 19 really. And uh, that was when I got pregnant with my daughter. And so I think quite often we find that, that uh, when we're expecting babies into the world, we return to our, our knitting practice. And that was certainly the case for me. So knitting baby garments, knitting jumpers for my husband, knitting myself some jumpers. Um, and so, so yeah, I would say for, probably from about the age of 19, I've kind of knitted fairly consistently, uh, on, on and off, but, but re relatively consistently. And then very intensively knitting probably over the last, gosh, five, six years, knitting every single day, um, and I, I do knit every single day. And one of the questions that I have been asked is, <laughs> you must have magical powers because my question is, how do you knit so fast? And I was also asked the question of how many hours in a day that I knit. Well, I, I can't tell you how many hours I knit in a day. Um, although when my husband read that question, he laughed and said all of them. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I don't knit all the hours in the day because I do do other things. <laughs> But, um, but I knit first thing when I wake up in the morning, I knit every evening, um, if I have time off in the afternoons, I'll say, you know, any, any time that I have um, that's not being invested in, in my work or in my family or in, in other pursuits, it goes into knitting. So I wouldn't say that I'm a super fast knitter. I would say that I'm a frequent knitter and I'm a fluid knitter because I hold a lot of muscle memory in my hands. So the the motions of, of knitting are very well practiced. And so there is a fluidity to my knitting style, I would say, that lends itself to uh, to the, the, the rapid creation, I suppose, of fabric. But um, but I am, a like I said, I am an English style thrower um, knit in my knitting style. Uh, which is traditionally a slower style than perhaps continental. I know that a lot of people um, try and learn continental as a, as a faster way. And I can do continental knitting. I don't like the tension that I get from continental knitting. So it's really only something I do when I am doing brioche. I do the brioche knit stitches continental because it saves my, my wrist um, from bringing the yarn back and forward. And I also use continental knitting for um, colour work when I'm doing two colour colour work. So I'll throw with one hand and I'll pick with the other. But other than that, um, I would always I would always do hold the hold the yarn in my right hand, and and so yeah, I'm I don't have magical powers, but I do knit a lot. I had a lovely question here from um, Adele Callanan, and she says. Um, her daughter Aiden is 12 years old and she wants to know if there is any pattern you want to start but you think is too challenging currently. Now, I think this is something, I, th I love this question, Aiden. So I think a lot of people are, are intimidated and scared to start knitting patterns. Uh, they think that there's going to be something that's going to be particularly difficult and so they build it up and then they don't start. But actually what my experience is, is that the best way to learn how to do it is just to start it and to overcome the challenges and the obstacles as we meet them. That said, my friend Jen gave me this book last year for my birthday. So I've had this book for a year and I look at it often because it is such a beautiful book. It's Glamoury by Alice Starmore. And it is a spectacularly beautiful 
fabric. Look at this. It's just stunning. What an amazing gift. And there are so many patterns in it that I want to knit, but they are on they are more complex. So I'm sitting with those going, I really want to do that. And so your question has really galvanized this for me. And this is one of the garments that I really want to knit because I love this collar. So this is the Raven Poncho. You see that? Isn't it absolutely amazing? So she also has the uh, Raven Cardigan, which I will find for you. So she has it like this with quite a small collar. Or she has this fabulous one, which I love, which is this one. And it looks like feathers. I love feathers. I love birds. And so I'm really thinking that this cardigan could be in my very near future. So yes, to answer your question, I think that would be quite a challenging knit, but it's not one that I'm scared of. And it's not one that I don't think I'm up to because I don't believe there's any there's any project that if we don't put our mind to and take our time and uh, and take it step by step and call in the helpers you know whenever we need um, advice or guidance there's always people out here in the community um online or maybe in your family that you can that you can call on and ask for help you can call on me and ask for help um i'd be more than happy to to support you and uh and yeah so if there is a if there's a pattern that you've got your eye on and that you think is maybe going to be a little bit challenging. Um, my, my words of encouragement would be to start and then see how you get on and call in the helpers as and when you need. Okay, so what's the next question? Uh, what do you find yourself knitting when you need something soothing for your soul? Melanie Coogan. That would be the um, of the Garter Goodness Shawl by Stephen West, which is this one here. Do you see this one? It's beautiful. And I have another one of those as well. So I, I find that when I get very stressed, the Garter Goodness is the, is the one that I'm turning to. But I would also say that this current half and half triangles wrap that I'm knitting, which is also a lot of garter, is also a very soothing project too. So Anything that involves a lot of garter and little shaping, I think, would be what I find most soothing. Uh, somebody asked, where is it? What's my... Oh, there, Linda Swan. I'm wondering what the favourite project that you have, that you have knitted. I would say it's always the most recent one. So I will show you this. I won't talk about it much just now because um, I will talk about it more next time. But this is just off the blocking mat. And this is the Slip Stitch Stravaganza by Stephen West, which is now no longer a mystery, thank heavens, because uh, October is now over, and so I can share it properly with you. But this is just off the blocking mat. So I would say that my favorite item is always the one that I've just finished. And this is the one I've just finished. So this is currently my favorite. But like I said, I will give you all the details and I'll tell you all about that next time. I would also say that what I'm wearing is actually one of my favourites and this is another Stephen West pattern. It is the Marled Magic sweater and I knitted it for my 40th birthday. And so it's used, it uses a lot of different yarns, a lot of mohair <laughs> and um, I chose these kind of shades of opal and dark wine and gold as my as my color palette and I'll just stand up so that you can you can see it more beautifully I love this moss stitch section and then we've got the back so it is huge and incredibly beautiful very soft nice for hugs <laughs> so I would say this is one of this was a lot of fun to make um, it's a modular knit so you really don't know kind of uh, when you're knitting the first time you don't know where it's going <laughs> you don't really understand how it's all going to fit together you don't it doesn't really look like a jumper <laughs> certainly not one that I've ever knitted before um, 
the, the construction is fascinating. And then I think uh, Linda from uh, Barbonitz once described this process as being like painting with yarn. And it really is. So we get this opportunity to really play with um, with the effect of holding two different strands of, of yarn together and adding in mohair and then seeing how that, that creates colour shifts and changes and combinations. And, and so this was a really fun knit, uh, one that I loved a lot. Okay. Can you recommend a shawl pattern that would be relatively easy to intermediate? Mary K. Linuski. Uh, Helen Stewart does wonderful shawl patterns. Highly recommend them. She has a wonderful way of uh, writing patterns so that they're situated within a spreadsheet. So you can, uh, every single row is listed as a separate, in a, as a separate cell. So you can really take it one row at a time. You can tick them off so you don't lose your place. Um, I would say that if you've not knitted shawls before, that would be a very good place to start. Um, going through her back catalogue and seeing if there's ones there that you would like to that you would like to explore, you'd like to tackle. But uh, yeah, I would say Helen Stewart is is your is your designer. Uh, what are my favourite needles? I love chai gu needles and it's because of, well, I love the lace tips, so I like a sharp uh, point and I think that's partially because I don't do the picking because I know that when you do picking, it can sometimes, sharp tips can sometimes hurt your finger and also I don't tend to use the top of my finger to push my, my needle when I'm throwing, so I like to have a sharp point um, to go through my yarn. It makes, it makes the process smoother for me. Um, and I would also say that the cable, because it's stainless steel, it doesn't hold memory. So it always holds, it's always pretty straight. Um, it doesn't coil back in on itself, which I can find can be a bit annoying. And the other needles that I use are interchangeable higher, higher sharps, um, which I also, which I, I love for sweater knitting in particular. Do I have a favorite knit designer? Oh, I do love Stephen West. <laughs> I also love Hoki Locatelli. I think her pattern, her um, constructions um, of garments are fascinating and very innovative, beautifully described. Um, I love Andrea Mowry's patterns. I really like her sweater patterns. They, they tend to fit me very well. And I think her, um, her shawl patterns are very meditative. Uh, what I love Erica Huser's uh, colour work accessories. I think the the colour work patterns from Inspired by Nature are among the most beautiful I've ever seen. So I would I would also include her in my my favourite knitters and obviously Alice Starmore, who's I've I've not knitted yet, but I do love her work. So <laughs> um, do you have a favourite place online? Uh, to have a favourite online shop to buy yarn in the UK, Amelia McBride Baker. I love Midwinter Yarns, which is situated just outside Edinburgh. Uh, the the owner brings in the most fabulous selection of, of yarns. That's where you can find your Snailden yarn, the Old Centrum yarns. And uh, yeah, I, I really like her and I like, I like her ethos. She also does the beautiful Lithuanian linen as well. So yeah, Midwinter Yarns, I think is my favorite online shop to buy yarn. Uh, I'd like to know which is your favorite yarn to use and why? Love mohair. <laughs> I love the fluff, even although I'm, I'm really finding with wearing face masks that almost every single face mask that I own has mohair fluff on the inside of it. So it, it, it tickles my nose every time I'm in a shop at the moment, but um. I love mohair because I love what, what it can do. I love how it helps us to, to fade from one colour to another. I love how it changes and creates um, very subtle marls. Um, so, I, so yes, I would say that that's a big favourite of mine. I, lo I, I do love rustic yarns. So I've just been really enjoying using this whole super soft and I'm so impressed with how, how it's knitted up and bloomed in, in this, this particular one. So. Uh, this particular shawl. So I would say that's also, that's a new favourite. 
and uh, I am also currently knitting. I had a sneaky wee cast on, and I'm knitting with some Massam BFL blend from Ginger Twist called Massam Mayhem, and it's wonderful too. Oh, and Gotland. I love Gotland yarn. That um, La Bienna May Helix yarn was just, I, I would really love to treat myself to some more of that Helix, I would say. I think I, somebody asked me what would be the yarn that I would, my kind of fantasy yarn, and I think it might be the La Bienna May Helix. And what is your favourite thing to knit from Marty Boss? Uh, shawls, I would say. <laughs> lots and lots of shawls. Okay, next quest, next set of questions. Gosh, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here. Hobbies. Uh, Alana Snow, what are you reading now? I'm still reading The Overstory by Richard Powers, but I'm also reading The Wild Places by uh, Robert McFarlane. I'm really very into um, ecological spirituality right now, and I'm, I'm enjoying finding out more about that and connecting more with the natural world. Uh, travel. Have you ever travelled to Canada? And also, if you could, where would you go for a holiday? So, I have travelled to Canada. I love Canada. <laughs> I've been to Montreal. Uh, I had to go and deliver a paper at the International Gothic Association. Um, I gave a paper on Stephen King and the pop-up book of The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon and The Gothic Heroine. So there you go. Uh, I actually spent a good couple of weeks in Montreal and had an absolute blast. I loved every moment of it. I would absolutely go back. So if I could go for a holiday, I would I would go back to Montreal, but I'd love to go and explore a bit more of Canada because I've heard it's a big place. <laughs> Have I ever been or ever wanted to visit Australia? Dot from Oz. Uh, yes, I have been to Australia. I've been twice uh, because I'm married to an Australian citizen. So <laughs> so I haven't been in a long time, but uh, we have been over twice. His family uh, lived in Melbourne. And so both times we spent uh, six weeks in Australia in Victoria. And we visited so many different places, everywhere from Port Ferry and along the, we traveled along the, the Otway Ranges, I think it is. And then we went along to 90 Mile Beach and we stayed in Mitung. Uh, we also went up to Mildura and uh, we visited Mo the Mungo National Park. And we went to Ballarat to the, the gold mining uh, event place, which we just loved. That was so much fun. Got really good memories of that and of course, Melbourne with its wonderful places to eat and uh, the Melbourne Zoo and we went to Phillip Island and the Mornington Peninsula and uh, yeah just Wilson's Prom yeah lots of lots of very fond memories and and would again I've heard that Australia is pretty big too so we've probably more to go and explore at some point but once we've uh, moved past all of this all of this awful COVID stuff uh, Keeper wants to know if I've ever been to the US and if so, which area did you visit? I've been to the US quite a lot. Uh, so the first time I went to the US, I think we went to Florida when I was to, to Disney, to Disney World when I was little. And then I um, went to New York. I went to New York for St. Patrick's Day as a surprise celebration for my mum's 40th birthday. And I was 16 then, I think. Uh, we stayed in San Francisco, I think when I was 18 for a three week holiday. Um, and then as an adult, um, I've been back to San Francisco because my very good friend Kathleen lives there. And we've been on some road trips down to Los Angeles and up to Portland. And so that's, that was always a, a lot of fun. I'd love to do more of that in the future. <laughs> And um, I've been to Boston a couple of times to go and do, uh, to give papers at academic conferences. And I've also been up to Maine uh, because my PhD focused on the work of Stephen King, the work and career of Stephen King. So I had to go to the University of Maine in Orono and I did three or four weeks 
research there, looking through the papers and the archives in the library there. So I think that's everywhere that I've been. So I've not really managed to do much of the south or of the middle. So lots more still to explore there too. <laughs> If you didn't live in Scotland, where in the world would you choose to live? From Mary Lennon. Hi, Mary. <laughs> uh, I think I would probably move to France because, yeah, move closer to mum and dad, enjoy some of that lovely sunshine, those wonderful food markets, the wine. <laughs> There's just so much to love over there. Uh, okay, Scotland. I got lots of Scotland questions. Uh, my question for you is, what about Edinburgh do you love the most, Norma Smith? Well, Norma, I think it's probably, it's pop, well, I would say it's actually it's familiarity. I've lived in Edinburgh since I was a little girl and I've um, moved out and then moved back at various different points. But uh, I would say that it's its familiarity. It feels like home to me. Um, I love its green spaces. I love the creamy colour of the sandstone and the way the light hits it first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Uh, I love the big landmarks of um, Arthur's Seat and the castle and Blackford Hill because you know, no matter where you move through the city, I feel like you can always kind of orientate yourself. Um, I love the good food, the good restaurants. I love the fun pubs. I love the people. Um, I love the cobbled streets. I love the little boutiques. Um, yeah, I love the parks. I just love lots and lots of things about it. I love Leith as well. Leith feels to me like how Edinburgh was when I was a teenager. And so it is, it is going through a period of quite rapid change right now. But I would say that Leith, that Leith and Newington kind of still hold um, that sense of, of nostalgic Edinburgh for me, perhaps. Heather Wilson, though, asked the last time that she says that the last time that she was in Edinburgh must be about 40 years ago. And she asked me what things have changed that I wish hadn't. I would say that Edinburgh has really suffered from the plague of Airbnb. <laughs> so a lot of um, a lot of areas in Edinburgh have kind of been cleared out of residence. And I think that's quite sad. Um, and I think the other thing has been the popularity of Harry Potter and Harry Potter tourism, uh, which while it's been lovely um, and has brought um, uh, you know, uh, income and economy to, to the area, and, and certainly tourists are incredibly important to the Edinburgh economy, I'd say kind of the Disneyfication of some of the, the shops and things, um, kind of trying to cater to that, um, kind of works against the specialness of the place. Um, so I would say I would say some of that too, but what can what can you do? These are just there's there's so many you know lovely things that that the that it kind of crowds out the more negative. I would say. What's my favorite yarn shops in Edinburgh? So I love Be Inspired, which is uh, Be Inspired Fibers, which is in Marchmont, which is May, which is run by a wonderful lady called May, and she has really beautiful yarn selection. I would say Ginger Twist, which is run by Jess, where she sells her own hand dyed, as well as an assortment of other brands like West Yorkshire Spinners. Um, so I think I would absolutely say that she's one of my favourites too. And the other, there's another two independent uh, yarn shops in Edinburgh, which is Cathy's Knits. She does sort of more Scottish uh, breeds and uh, Scottish brands. Uh, and she's just off Bro oh, she's on Broughton Road, uh, which is just off York Place, so very central. And also very central is Macquarie's, which is uh, down Frederick Street, and that's a Rowan stockist. So those are the main independent, yeah, those are the four independent yarn shops um, that, you can, that you can check out in Edinburgh. In Glasgow, if you're interested, the place you need to go is the Yarn Cake. So. Uh, okay. Have I always lived in Edinburgh? No, I've not. I have lived quite a few places in, in Scotland. I've lived in Ayrshire, over on the west coast, the southwest coast. Um, I've lived uh, on the north coast, the northwest tip of Scotland, so very up the very top. 
I was born in Stirling, right in the very middle of the central belt. And I've lived in Haddington in East Lothian, so just outside of Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, I've lived in a variety of different places in and around um, Scotland. But Eli, Ellie, G Ellie Gaudio, I think your name is, I uh, should like to know, um, have I always lived in Scotland because I don't have a strong Scottish accent? I have always lived in Scotland. I haven't lived anywhere else. Um, this has been my home for my whole life. And I think I've got, I do have a Scottish accent, um, but obviously it's not, it's not particularly strong to me. And I don't think it's particularly strong to anybody else. As I said, I have done a lot of um, teaching and public speaking, uh, delivering uh, the academic papers and things to a wide audience and a wide range of, um, of people for whom English isn't necessarily their first language or that they, they come from other places where they're not necessarily going to be used to a particularly strong Scottish accent. And so I think perhaps I have cultivated uh, an accent which is perhaps a bit softer and is more easily understandable and, and clearer to clear to communicate because communication is, is incredibly important to me. It's important to be understood. And, uh, and so I love my accent and I love Scottish accents and I absolutely intend to hold on to, on to my own. <laughs> and I also want to be understood. So perhaps the combination of that is, is resulted in the way that I speak, but that's only bringing kind of that analytical perspective to that because really otherwise I just speak how I speak. So <laughs> I would say I probably have quite an Edinburgh accent. I think people who, um, people who know um, Scottish accents and people who are from Edinburgh would recognise my accent as particularly coming from Edinburgh. Um, and that is the other thing I would say too is that accents are quite, we talk about a Scottish accent, but um, accents vary a lot um, in, in Scotland. So you could go maybe even just like two miles down the road and encounter quite a different accent. Uh, one that you would still recognise as Scottish, but it would sound different to the ear. And so, so that's something which I think, particularly if you come from someplace like America or Australia, these, or Canada, these very, very large countries, I think the, there is accent, absolutely is accent variation from one place to another. But I think because we are a much smaller country and we're much more condensed, that the accent variation is very rapid from like one village to the next. And, and so uh, there is no such thing necessarily as a, as a homogenous Scottish accent. Um, there is accents that can be recognised as Scottish. And hopefully mine's one of those. <laughs> okay. Uh, calm. So many people asking me, how, how do I manage to stay so calm? Maureen Candlish wonders, um, do I lose my temper much? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't lose my temper much at all. Um, I think anger is very important. Um, it's an important energy to be expressed, um, possibly to be channeled and certainly to be released um, in, in positive ways and um, to create change. I think that's an incredibly important thing. But I, but as for losing my temper, I'm a, I would say that I'm a very even-tempered person. Uh, anger is not something that comes terribly quickly. I would say I'm much more of a slow burn. <laughs> um, so yes, I don't, I don't lose my temper. Uh, how do I manage to stay so calm? Eleni Malandraki is asking. Uh, I think calm is well won, actually. I'm not sure anybody just, you know, like a swan gracefully glides calmly through their existence. Um, I don't think life is lived as a as a one note existence, as a one note experience, I think we are all multi dimensional, multi faceted, and within that we all have the capacity to experience the full spectrum of our emotions and feelings, and I'm no exception. I'm no exception to that. Um, I I think anxiety is certainly something that I've experienced and and continue to experience. Um, I think, you know, moving through the particular times that we are, if we're not experiencing some kind of stress, I would be, I'd be very surprised, you know, I, I think 
it's something that's that's very prevalent um, something that we're asked to engage with and to to root into and ground into um and and find our and find our central point i would say certainly my knitting practice is incredibly important to my um holding on to my sense of self in such a fragmented and chaotic world uh, if i can come back to the present come back to the here and now find my breath find my center point reconnect with that that inner flame um i think all of those kinds of things really really help to to help me to maintain an, an even keel um whilst you know just underscoring that uh that you know calm isn't what we what i experience all the time you know i do think it's a i do think calm is something that i project i think it's something that i try and intentionally nurture in the spaces that i hold uh, so that they feel safe and they feel secure and strong and nurturing spaces they feel like spaces for strong connection they feel like spaces where people can show up and be their their full selves and feel accepted that's that's the qualities that's the values that i want to transmit and i want people to encounter when they engage with me and so i suppose holding on to that level of intentionality as well uh, contributes to that that sense of calm that maybe you feel when you're when you're watching one of my podcasts okay spirituality i'm zipping through these questions now <laughs> what is your horoscope sign well, as I mentioned before, I've studied astrology for about the last eight, nine years now. So I can tell you that my sun is in Scorpio, my moon is in Aquarius, and my rising sign, or my AC, is um, in Sagittarius, directly conjunct Neptune. <laughs> now, what all of that means, we could go into for a very long time, but if you, if you speak astrological shorthand, then you're probably nodding and going, hmm. <laughs> If you ever want to explore astrology with me a little bit more, maybe let me know, and because uh, I've been thinking a bit more about ways in which to to expand explorations around that, particularly looking at goddess asteroids. Because the wonderful thing about goddess asteroids is that we can we can put them into our own personal charts, and we can see, for example, where the goddess Artemis occurs within our chart, or where Hestia lives in your chart, or where Ariadne lives in your chart. So. So we can look at all of those kinds of things and I find that really fascinating both in my own chart and, and peering into other people's. Uh, my question is, this is from Sue Webb, my question is, did you know from a young age that you had a strong spiritual sense? Now, my dad talks about how one evening I got terribly upset because I became convinced that uh, when I would fall asleep, that I would astrally project my soul out of my body and then it might not be able to find its way back home again. So, <laughs> so I don't know how old I was when I was, um, when I was crying and very upset over that, but I was probably about seven or eight, so I was pretty, pretty young. They also laugh over the time that I asked them, um, was the baby Jesus born with the help of pliers? So I can only anticipate that I'd been at Sunday school and in another instance had encountered the concept of forceps and had put the two together and became very interested about how the baby Jesus came into the world. So <laughs> and I was very young at that stage. So <laughs> so I do think that um, I, I certainly I remember being fascinated by ghosts and strange occurrences and I used to, I used to buy a copy of the Fortean Times every every month I was fascinated by things like spontaneous combustion and um astral astral planes and all kinds of things so um so yeah my my interest has always been towards the mysterious and uh and I think in that way the mystery has always been very willing to step forward and and um and enter into play with me you know so <laughs> Okay, so Little Big Knits, so this is Selma. Um, because you are someone who delves into the spiritual in a variety of ways, what is it that you do to lift yourself up when you are down? I ask this because I feel that so many people are experiencing such an array of emotions these days. 
maybe some who would otherwise not under normal circumstances. I think getting out into nature is actually one of the best ways that we can lift ourselves up when we're feeling a bit down. I think coming into an encounter with big trees, I think walking beside water, uh, I think feeling the ground beneath our feet, smelling the smells of the earth and of the air, hearing the bird song, I think all of that is incredibly elevating for the soul and really helps us to unplug from some of those um, stories that are being spun that we can get so caught up in and um, so anxious and stressed about that actually the, the walking in nature I think really helps us to come back into our bodies to be a bit more present to where we are right now with what's occurring so that we can then consciously choose how we engage with, with those stories um, rather than being swept up in them. Uh, okay, one last one for spiritual, I think. Lexi Whalebone asks, what little nuggets of magic or faith do you tuck into your everyday life? I, I have a belief that I'm special. I don't believe that I'm any more special than anybody else. I believe in everybody's specialness, mine included. <laughs> so I think that life is an incredibly precious thing. I think it's something to be cherished. I think it has a myriad of expressions. I find it completely fascinating and beautiful and awe-inspiring in its richness and its in its complexity. And that's through the way in which it expresses in myself and how it expresses through everybody and everything. And I think looking with that lens that really looks to see the specialness, looks to see the preciousness of everything that I'm encountering is something is something magical and something which really informs, I think, not only my, my own personal sense of self, but um, also informs my sense of gratitude and appreciation for everybody and everything that I come into into an engagement with everything that I meet. Uh, I really want to see the specialness and I do see the specialness in you. And I think that's, I think that's a magical thing. So, yeah. Oracle cards, lots of Oracle card questions. So I brought out a few to show you. So somebody, oh, who was it? Tammy J asks, do you use tarot as well as Oracle cards? Yes, I do. I use this tarot deck every day. <laughs> this is the Wild Unknown Tarot by Kim Kranz. Um, it's the deck that I use with all my on all my client calls. It is a traditional. It's traditional tarot in the sense that it has the the court cards and the major arcana and things, but it's not traditional images. Right. So, but I find them very powerful images. And so very effective. So I use this deck. Oops, that way. I use this deck every day. And whether that's to draw a card for myself or whether that's to draw cards for my clients um, on my calls, on my one-on-one -on -one calls. I also use this deck in my monthly goddess guidance readings, uh, the PDFs that go out on the first of the month. And I tend to do a large tarot reading in the My Word Goddess readings that go out in uh, December and January. So so that's probably my most my most used deck would be that one. Uh, somebody asked for a recommendation for, oh there you go, I'd like to know if there's a particular deck of cards you'd recommend as a starting point. Starting point for Goddess, um, this is one of my starting points, this is the Goddess Oracle and it's by Amy Sophia Marashinsky, and it's illustrated by Harana Yanto. And I like this deck because it doesn't present the goddesses as kind of these kind of glossy cosmopolitan cover stars, <laughs> which some of them are. I, I just, I find it much I find it easier to connect with. There's there's a nana with her sister Arishka Gell that I mentioned earlier. It's Morgan Morgan Lefay. 
So uh, I find that that's a very good deck. So if you're looking for a goddess deck, I would say you can't go far wrong with that one. I recently just got this deck, which is called um, the Wee Star Oracle, which is a really stunning deck, which my friend um, Rhea just bought for me for my for my birthday. And this is the first card that I drew, which I just cut to just now. Isn't it gorgeous? Like a selkie. The selkies are very important imagery for me, important stories. So that was a, a lovely gift, which I wanted to share with you. And the other Oracle deck I was going to share with you is this one, which is also by Kim Kranz. It's the Wild Unknown Archetypes deck. And lovely box and the guidebook. And these are circular oracle cards. I use these a lot as well. I use these at least once a week in um, group calls that I, that I do. Um, I think these are fantastic. They move through a variety of different archetypes, the archetypal selves, archetypal places, arch like that, the threshold. Um, archetypal tools and archetypal initiations. So there's a tool, which is the vow. Uh, let's see if I can find one of the initiations. Um, the initiations are like uh, Kairos and um, Aletheia for truth and Apocalypta and all kinds of things like that. They're, they're fascinating. It's got a very good guide, which I would recommend. That you that you read alongside it to begin with just to give you a good starting place and there's some really interesting spreads that you can that you can explore um, I intend to use one of those uh, tomorrow when I do myself a birthday reading if you are completely new to Oracle decks uh, my recommendation would be to again to stay very playful with them and uh, somebody asked let me see Here's this question. Uh, do you choose a card each day to make decisions about your day or just use them for entertainment? And this is from Deborah Mason. And my answer to that is, is that I wouldn't say I use them for either of those things. Uh, I use them in the same way as I use the, ar the goddess archetypes. So they provide me with frameworks for seeing my world. They're reflecting back aspects of myself that perhaps I'm not seeing, that my attention is being drawn to, is asking me to come into awareness about something and so or to think about something or to to focus on it and to reveal something that I didn't already know about myself and my psyche and my soul. So that's why I use oracle cards. That's how I would recommend that you use oracle cards. I don't think they're there to dictate um, the the order or the meaning of our lives. I don't think they, I don't use them as um, divination tools. I'm not foreseeing the future with them. Um, they are mirroring back to me parts of my soul, parts of my psyche, which are calling to be recognized, calling to be seen, calling to be honored and brought into, brought into the family of things you know, and be integrated. So that's why I use them. And within that, you know, they, they take me on, on journeys into, into stories and into metaphor and into, into wild, wise seeing. And, and that's, that's the fun of them, I think. And, and that's the power of them, too. When choosing an oracle deck, I think you should just always go with the one that looks most interesting to you. I think you're being asked to trust your soul, you know, that it's going to call you towards that which is most illuminating and most interesting and most inspiring for you. If you pick up a deck of cards because I tell you to pick it up um, and not because it's one that you find genuinely interesting, you won't stick with it for very long. I don't imagine you'll be all that interested in it. <laughs> okay, so last section, which I have labelled miscellaneous. How young in age are you, Amy? By Christina Hayes. <laughs> I will be 42 tomorrow, which I have determined is the meaning of life birthday. So apparently after tomorrow, all will become clear. <laughs> Nancy Fraser's wondering what my favourite Christmas tradition is. I love to watch the Harry Potter movies and the Fantastic Beast movies 
um, in the in the lead up to Christmas, and then in the week between Christmas and New Year, I love to watch the Hobbit movies, and then in the New Year, the first week of the New Year, I watch the Lord of the Rings movies, and I do that every year, and that is a ritual for me. <laughs> Carol Donnelly says, "I'm going through a very sudden bereavement. I wonder if you could recommend a book." that I could read that would perhaps offer some comfort or help to get through this very difficult time. I just wanted to say I'm so sorry to hear this, Carol, and I think that grief is one of those big emotions that quite often defies them um, speaking. It, we can't tend to find the words to say the unsayable. And I think when we're in that territory, that the map becomes metaphor and the map becomes poetry. And so I'm wondering, rather than uh, a book, uh, like a how-to guide or something like that, or a memoir even, that perhaps the, the book that I could recommend to you would be poetry. And Mary Oliver's book, Thirst, is a collection of poems that she wrote after she had lost her partner. And so I'm wondering whether that would be, that would be a, a book to, to look at. But really, if you're looking for um, any poetry that to support you in this particular moment, uh, there's quite a lot of really good collections, really good um, anthologies. And, uh, and I think just diving into as much poetry as you possibly can that feels good and feels supportive and lovely to you right now um, might, might be a really, a really s strong sense of um, nourishment and fortitude and release and relief and ease. So just wanting you to know that I'm thinking of you and that if you're experiencing, if anybody's experiencing any grief right now, that I'm sending you so much love and that I'm holding you in my heart. And yeah, wishing you some good poems, good poetry to help guide you through. Okay, Nick Cohen asks, have you ever worked as a voice artist reading literature for the audiobooks? No, I haven't. However, I have read some of my own writing and made it available as, as audio uh, in, a, in a variety of different offerings that I've had out in the past. And I have read a lot of children, a lot of stories. <laughs> and I've also done a lot of reading out loud in my, um, in my lectures and in my tutorials and things. I think uh, a lot of literature asks to be read out loud. I think it takes on a different quality when it is heard. And so, so yes, so thank you for the lovely compliment. And uh, no, I had not technically read literature for audiobooks. And last of all, Louisa Munoz asked, could I share a wish for next year? Well, I think my wish would be for resilience and togetherness. I think we're, we're stronger when we're together. I think we're stronger when we have, you know, beautiful, strong places of connection. Um, when we're integrated, uh, when we are well nourished, well fed, well met. So I would wish for all of that for all of us, uh, that you feel well met by your circumstances, by the people that are surrounding you, um, that you are staying healthy and well. And yes, that I'm wishing us all resilience to see through any points of difficulty, challenge and obstacle so that we can meet them well and feel ourselves fortified and strengthened, toughened and tenderized um, through the process and come out the other side strong. Okay, my darlings. Well, that was, gosh, a long podcast with lots of questions answered. I hope that I've done justice to your cues with my A's. <laughs> and yes, next time, will be a much more straightforward podcast. Uh, we'll be looking over all of my knitting things that I've been finishing off. I've finished a couple of things that I'll be sharing with you. I've cast some new things on <laughs> uh, that might be cast off by the time we speak. Uh, so I'll have lots of knitting to share with you next time. So I hope that you join me then. And yes, remember the three winners that I read out at the beginning, please do get in touch with me and let's organize the sending out of your of your prizes okay my darlings for my birthday this year i'm wishing you all uh, a wonderful weekend a wonderful next couple of weeks and i will see you again soon